The sunlight poured into my office, reflecting off the awards and citations that adorned the walls. Every award, every acknowledgement felt like a testament to the years of struggle I, Clara, had endured to get to where I was. As the founder and CEO of a tech startup, life was a whirlwind, but one I wouldn't change for anything. One evening, as I was wrapping up work, the door to my office creaked open and in walked Peter, my husband of 15 years, holding two glasses of wine. To us, he said, raising a glass, his charming smile still managing to melt my heart. To us, I replied, clinking my glass with his. We sipped in comfortable silence. In these moments, I believed we were the epitome of a perfect couple. We were the power couple our friends admired, the couple our children looked up to. Speaking of which, our two kids, Amelia and Max, were my pride and joy. Amelia, with her long wavy hair and a determination that mirrored mine, was in her senior year of high school, already receiving offers from top colleges. Max, on the other hand, was a freshman with a wit sharper than most adults and a kindness that could light up any room. Our evenings were usually filled with family dinners and games. That particular evening was no different. As I entered our modern, spacious home, the aroma of roasted chicken greeted me. In the living room, our children sat with Diane, my best friend since college. The three were engrossed in a heated debate over a board game. Cheating again, Aunt Diane, Max quipped, narrowing his eyes playfully at her. Deanne chuckled, her curly hair bouncing with mirth. You know me too well, kiddo, but hey, all's fair in love and board games. I laughed, wrapping an arm around her. Teaching my children bad habits, are you? She grinned, only the fun ones. It was moments like these that I cherished the most. Diane had been my confidant for years, and over time she had become an integral part of our family. She had been there through the ups and downs, celebrating every success, and comforting me through every setback. It was reassuring to know she was always there for me, just as I was for her. As the evening wore on, we settled down in the living room. Peter began recounting an amusing incident at his firm. You wouldn't believe it, Clara. Mr. Henderson actually wore two different shoes to the meeting today. He laughed heartily, and we all joined in. Amelia rolled her eyes. Dad, you have no room to talk. Remember when you wore your pajama bottoms to my parent-teacher conference? Peter chuckled, slightly embarrassed. That was one time, and I was in a rush. I interjected, teasingly, and let's not forget the time he tried to fix the sink and ended up flooding the kitchen. Everyone laughed, reminiscing over shared memories, filling our home with warmth and joy. As the night drew to a close, Diane got up to leave. Giving me a tight hug, she whispered, You have everything, Clara. A loving family, a successful career. Promise me you'll never take it for granted. I looked into her eyes, puzzled by the sudden intensity, but nodded, I promise. Little did I know how soon everything I held dear would be threatened. But for now, in that moment, life was perfect. The vibrant colors of autumn began to coat our neighborhood, but there was a chill in the air, one that wasn't just due to the changing seasons. I began noticing things, tiny at first, that made me uneasy. One evening, while preparing dinner, I heard Peter's muffled voice from our study. He rarely took calls at home, especially not this late. Curiosity got the best of me, and I approached the door, pressing my ear against it. No, Dane. I think it's getting worse, he murmured. We need to be careful. Pulling back, I felt my heart race. What were they discussing? What was getting worse? Shaking off the paranoia, I chalked it up to some professional issue. However, as the days turned into weeks, Peter's behavior grew more peculiar. There were countless secret phone calls, hushed conversations I wasn't privy to, and meetings at odd hours. One Saturday morning, as I was tidying our room, a slip of paper fell out of Peter's blazer. It read, Meet me at the Lark Cafe, 4 p.m. D. The Lark Cafe was a quaint little place Peter and I used to frequent during our early dating days. Why was he meeting Diane there? The thought nagged at me all day but when he came down in that blazer later that afternoon, I mustered up the courage to ask, Going out, Peter. He seemed startled for a moment but quickly masked it with a smile. Just some last-minute work stuff, love. Feeling bold, I pressed on. With Diane? He hesitated. Uh, yes, she had some insights I needed for a project. I wanted to believe him, but a gnawing suspicion told me otherwise. To make matters worse, Diane's attitude towards me began to shift. Our regular coffee meetups felt strained. She was distant, almost cold. One day, after a particularly long silence, she finally spoke, her voice laced with feigned concern. 
Clara, are you feeling all right? Taken aback, I replied, I'm fine, why? She hesitated, choosing her words. It's just, you've seemed a bit off lately. Forgetful. Distracted. Peters mentioned it too. I frowned, trying to remember any such incidents. I've been a little stressed with work, but I'm fine, Diane. Diane reached across, touching my hand lightly. Promise me you'll see a doctor if it gets worse. We're just worried about you. The concern in her voice felt staged, rehearsed. But why? What was happening? That night, over dinner, I decided to address the elephant in the room. With Amelia and Max engrossed in their meals, I spoke, my voice low. Peter, Diane mentioned today that you're concerned about my health. He looked up, clearly caught off guard. Oh, she did. Yes, she said I've been, forgetful. I watched his face, trying to gauge his reaction. He sighed, setting down his fork. Clara, I didn't want to bring it up, but yes, there have been moments. Like when you forgot our anniversary dinner reservation last week. I blinked, he was right. I had forgotten. But was that reason enough? Before I could respond, Max piped in, Mom, you also forgot my soccer game last Tuesday. My heart sank. Was I really slipping, or was there a different game at play here? Amelia, ever the protective elder sister, quickly countered, That's just stress, right, Mom? You have a lot on your plate. I nodded, grateful for her support, but also deeply unsettled. I'll, I'll see a doctor. Peter reached out, his hand on mine. It's for the best, Clara. We just want you to be okay. But as I looked into his eyes, the same ones I'd fallen in love with all those years ago, I couldn't shake off the feeling that there was something he wasn't telling me. My life had once felt like a well-composed melody, but now there was a discordant note that seemed to grow louder each day. The seed of doubt had been sown, and the eerie feeling of being watched or, rather, monitored was omnipresent. One evening, as I was heading to the garden to grab some fresh herbs for dinner, I stopped in my tracks. Peter's voice floated from the slightly ajar window of his study, accompanied by Diane's. They were speaking in hushed tones, but their urgency was palpable. If we can get her committed, everything will be easier, Peter whispered. Are you sure the doctor will cooperate? Diane's voice trembled with nervousness. He's been paid off. His statement will make her look completely unstable, Peter assured her. My heart pounded loudly in my ears. My own husband and best friend were conspiring against me. Desperation and disbelief welled up inside me, but I needed more proof. Later that night, when Peter was in the shower, I sneaked into his study. Drawers and papers everywhere. Amid the chaos, a neatly stapled stack caught my eye. The top sheet had an official-looking letterhead, Dr. Gregory Whitmore, psychiatrist. The ensuing pages detailed an alleged decline in my mental health, punctuated by fabricated incidents and outright lies. Tears welled up in my eyes, but there wasn't time for emotions. I needed a plan. Over the next few days, I began to meticulously stage lapses in my memory, misplacing things, forgetting conversations, and mixing updates. Each act, perfectly timed for Peter or Diane to witness. If they wanted a show, I'd give them one. Amelia and Max, however, grew increasingly concerned. Their once confident mother seemed to be crumbling before their eyes. One evening, after I forgot, Amelia's birthday dinner, she confronted me. Mom, what's going on? Amelia's voice trembled, her eyes filled with worry. Max added, you've never been like this. Please, tell us. Taking a deep breath, I ushered them into the living room. The truth needed to come out. Listen, what I'm about to tell you has to stay between us. Promise? They exchanged a worried glance but nodded. I'm not losing my memory or my mind. I'm pretending to. Your father and Diane, they're planning something. I revealed the conversation I overheard and the papers I discovered. Amelia's face contorted in shock. Why would Dad do this? Max, his usually jovial demeanor gone, whispered, We need to do something. We will, I assured them, determination replacing my earlier despair. But for now, you must play along. Pretend you believe their lies, all while we gather the evidence we need. Amelia, tears glistening, hugged me fiercely. We're with you, Mom. Max chimed in, always. The early rays of dawn were just peeking through the horizon when I found myself outside a discreet office building in the heart of the city. A meeting with attorney Mitchell Reeves had been set up through a trusted acquaintance. Mitchell was known for his fierce advocacy and discretion, and I needed both. As I entered his office, he stood up, concern evident in his eyes. Mrs. Harrison, 
Please, take a seat. I don't know where to start, I began, my voice shaky. He leaned forward, just start from the beginning. And so, I did. By the time the story spilled out, Mitchell was already scribbling down notes, his expression grim. First, he said, looking up, we need evidence. Following Mitchell's advice, I planted small voice recorders in strategic spots around the house. Dinner conversations, private chats in the study, phone calls, I recorded them all. Peter and Diane, believing they had the upper hand, became less cautious in their discussions. Words of deceit and manipulation flowed freely, and I captured each one. One evening, during dinner, I cautiously brought up a topic. Peter, with my forgetfulness lately, I've been thinking, maybe I should sign over power of attorney to you, just in case. His eyes widened slightly, a glint of triumph visible. Are you sure, Clara? That's a significant decision. It's just, I want to make sure the kids are taken care of, and you too, I replied, forcing vulnerability into my voice. Deanne, who was coincidentally over that evening, chimed in a little too eagerly. It's a sensible decision, Clara, with your health and all. Peter will take care of everything. Encouraged by my apparent submission, Peter expedited his plan. Financial statements, meant to show my reckless spending, began popping up. I secretly copied each one, building a case of financial manipulation. The coup de grace, however, came from my secret visits to other medical professionals. Multiple psychiatrists and psychologists, after thorough evaluations, provided statements attesting to my mental stability. Their testimonies would be pivotal. One day, while I was in the garden, Diane approached, her eyes gleaming with anticipation. Clara, have you thought more about the power of attorney? It would be such a weight off your shoulders. I looked at her, feigning hesitation. I just, I need a little more time. She leaned in, her voice dripping with fox sweetness. It's for the best, dear. And it would mean a lot to Peter. He's been so stressed, worrying about you. Little did she know, her every word was being captured by the tiny recorder in my pocket. The pieces were coming together, but the final showdown was yet to come. The courtroom buzzed with whispers as people filed in. Many of them, friends, family, and acquaintances, had gathered, expecting the spectacle of witnessing my fall from grace. At the center of it all, Peter and Diane sat smugly, sharing fleeting glances of triumph. Order in the court, the judge announced, bringing the room to silence. As the proceedings began, Peter's attorney painted a grim portrait of a mentally unstable wife and the need for Peter to have control over the assets for the children's sake. False medical records were presented and fabricated stories shared. When my turn came, I calmly said, Your Honor, while they've shown you a carefully crafted lie, I have the truth. First, I presented my own medical records and testimonies from numerous professionals attesting to my mental stability. All these evaluations state I'm mentally sound, I pointed out. The murmurs began, but the piece de resistance was yet to come. Now, for the real truth of their conspiracy, I declared producing a small device. Your Honor, I'd like to play some recordings. As the recordings played, Peter's voice discussing their scheme and Diane talking about the financial gains they'd make, the courtroom was filled with gasps. Their illicit relationship, their plans, everything was laid bare. Furthermore, I continued, pulling out a stack of papers, these are financial documents that show Peter's manipulations intending to prove my supposed recklessness. Peter's face was ashen, his previous confidence replaced with dread. Diane looked like a deer caught in headlights. My children, Amelia and Max, took the stand, speaking of my careful actions to gather evidence and the character they'd known all their lives. The judge, after a moment of silence, took a deep breath. In light of the overwhelming evidence presented, it's clear that Mrs. Clara Harrison has been the victim of a devious scheme. Officers approached, handcuffing Peter and Diane, who were now facing not just legal repercussions, but also the judgmental stares of those they had deceived. The verdict was swift. All allegations against my mental health were dismissed. Peter and Diane were taken into custody, their treacherous plot now public knowledge. As we exited, my children by my side, there was a renewed respect in the eyes of onlookers. The ordeal had ended, justice served, and the truth had triumphed. The Clara household had a palpable air of change. In the aftermath of the courtroom upheaval, there was a void left by Peter's departure, but it was quickly filled with warmth, love, and newfound respect. Amelia sauntered into the kitchen one morning, her hair tuzzled from sleep, and found me preparing breakfast. Morning, Mom, she mumbled, rubbing her eyes. 
smells good. Morning, love, I replied, placing a plate of pancakes in front of her. Got a surprise for you and Max later. Max, hearing his name, bounded in surprise, what is it? Ah, I wagged a finger, patience. Over breakfast, the kids and I talked more openly than we had in years. Without the shadow of Peter and Diane's treachery, our bonds had only grown stronger. Later that day, in my fully restored office, I reveled in the familiar ambience. The smell of leather from the chairs, the view of the city skyline, the touch of the mahogany desk, it was a sensory reminder of my resilience. There was a soft knock on the door. Sarah, my secretary, peeked in, the new financial reports, Mrs. Clara. Thank you, Sarah, I smiled, taking them. As she left, my gaze wandered to the family photo on my desk, taken just after the trial. It wasn't just a photo, it was a testament to our endurance. Amelia and Max entered, the excitement clear on their faces. Mom, the surprise, Max prodded. I chuckled, handing them two envelopes. Inside were tickets to a world tour. A fresh start for the three of us. Their reactions were priceless, gasps, hugs, and promises of packing immediately. The sun began its descent, casting a golden hue into the room. I gestured for the kids to sit, and we took a moment, basking in the serenity. Mom, Amelia began, her eyes glistening, after everything, how did you? Survive, I completed for her. She nodded. I took a deep breath. Betrayal teaches us, often painfully, who we can trust. But it's also a testament to our strength. Deception lies, they're the tools of the weak. Max looked up, his youthful face showing a maturity beyond his years. You taught us that it's not the battles we face, but how we face them. I smiled, holding back tears. And you two were my pillars of strength. The room was silent, save for the distant city sounds. The three of us, bound by trials and love, had emerged not just survivors, but warriors. Always remember, I began, holding their hands, trust is a fragile thing, and once broken, it's hard to rebuild. But our strength, our resilience, and our love for each other, that's eternal. And as the day gave way to night, the Clara legacy wasn't just of wealth and success, but of undying spirit and unbreakable bonds.